The Studio Camera 4K Plus and 4K Pro are two live video production cameras from Blackmagic Design. They're both packed full of interesting features for use in studio setups and alongside your ATEM switcher. In this video, we'll explore the Plus and the Pro camera and try to decide if either one is right for you. And I'll also use the cameras to shoot this video. So right now I'm using the Studio 4K Pro and I'll also let you know if I've changed cameras throughout the video. And just to let you know, Blackmagic has sent the Plus model and the Pro model over to this channel to take a look at, make some videos about and then send back whenever we're done making these videos. These cameras are very much a refresh of the previous Blackmagic Studio cameras with some tweaks in terms of design and a few features added in there to work even better with the new ATEM Mini series of switchers. And if this video doesn't go through enough details on these two new cameras, I have a few more coming out pretty soon. So be sure to subscribe below and you'll see those videos when they're posted. Let's take a look around the Studio Camera 4K Plus first. So right on the front here, we can see the MFT mount, which is where you'll mount your MFT lenses. I have a few options available in terms of MFT lenses and we'll explore those a little bit throughout the video. I actually don't have any powered zoom lenses though, so I'll leave it up to some other folks to cover those kind of features. Still looking around the Plus model, we have two USB ports on this side for drives and for the accessories. And below that is a 3.5 millimeter for headphones and for mic input. On the other side is a HDMI output for the video signal and for camera control coming in. And then below is the power for the camera. Around the back we have a sunshade which is covering the 600 nits 7 inch display. It's pretty easy to open the sunshade or just pop it off completely which actually makes more sense for me. To the left of the screen we have some camera control options like the on off switch, assignable function buttons and a settings dial. And on the right we have controls for brightness, contrast and focus peaking. I think the overall design is really nice, it's pretty robust and I like these big handles you can just grab the camera, take it out of a case, put it on a tripod and you're ready to go. It's also a little bit smaller than I expected. From the launch video, I thought the camera would have been a bit bigger, but it is, um, it's a bit smaller overall than I thought. Also in the box, you get this mounting plate that allows for a 15 millimeter reel system, and you get these little camera numbers so you can attach those to the tally lights. Well, we'll discuss that later. When I hook up some power and switch it on, the first surprise was there's about five to seven seconds where nothing really happens. Now in a quiet space, you may hear the fan just kick in, but otherwise there's no indication of lights to tell you that you actually turn on the camera. So I just waited for a few seconds. It came on, it was perfectly fine, but it was just a little bit worrying at the start. But now that it turned on, we can explore it some more. And I think this is where Blackmagic cameras really shine is the menu systems and the on-screen options. Working my way along the top here, I have options for guides, frames per second, shutter speed, iris, time code, the gain, the white balance, and the tint. I can tap on any one of these and change the settings or use the settings dial to adjust it quickly. And then if I press the settings dial, it'll close that menu. The dial is also useful for iris whenever none of the settings are open. At the bottom of the screen, I have a histogram. I can see recording, stop, start, and the drive space. And then on the right, I have the audio mixer. A couple of other notable controls here is if I swipe up or down, I can remove that bottom information. If I swipe left or right, I can change the name of my recordings and clips. If I double tap on the screen, it'll zoom in and then I can pinch and zoom and drag around a little bit more. I can also touch and hold to focus the camera. On the top right, we have the settings for the camera. We certainly don't need to walk through every setting on this video, but here's a few just to note. The record menu lets you pick the recording quality. Now you can only record in Ultra HD right now and in Blackmagic RAW. Maybe that'll change in the future, but I suspect that if you want to record in anything but Blackmagic RAW, then you'll use a different system. There's also a time-lapse mode in the recording menu, so you can turn on a time-lapse and record that. Under the setup menu, I can choose what the functions buttons do. For example, the function two is my autofocus button. Over here in the LUTs menu, I can choose a LUT to apply to the camera. And then in the monitor option, I can decide whether or not that LUT is applied to the internal display or the external HDMI output. I've attached my Samsung T5 SSD to the camera and it pops up right in the bottom showing how many minutes of Ultra HD recording I can manage on its available space. What's really nice about this is I can record a really good quality ISO of this camera in Blackmagic RAW for use later in post. I can also attach a second SSD to the second USB port and then whenever one fills up, it'll just jump over to the next one and record to that. Like I mentioned already, you can only record in Blackmagic RAW. If you want to record in MP4 and if you want to record in Full HD instead of Ultra HD, then I suspect that you should go down the route of ATEM Mini recordings and uh, capture it that way. Now you might have spotted it already, but there is a large tally light right on the top of the camera, which can be seen from the front, from the back, and then there's another tally light just for the camera operator. 
This tally information is pulled right from an ATEM switcher if you have it connected. So it goes red when it's on program, it goes green when it's on preview, and it turns off whenever it's not on either of those. Now once you've started using tally in your setup, it can be hard to stop using it, especially for on-screen talent and for your camera operators. It's a really, really nice thing to have. And the fact that it works so seamlessly with the ATEM, plugging one cable into both sides, gives you that data back and forth. It's really nice. You also get this little set of number plates which you can slot into the tally light holder. And interestingly, you get up to 20 of these little numbers. So I wonder if there's a bigger HDMI switcher coming out or something like that. Who knows? Uh, it'll be pretty cool though. You'll also find that the tally also works whenever you have an SSD attached and you're recording. Now, if you're recording to an SSD whenever the ATEM is not connected, then the tally light goes red whenever you start recording and it turns off whenever you stop recording. And strangely enough, whenever you have the camera connected to an ATEM, it goes red whenever it's on air, it goes green whenever it's in preview, and then it goes orange whenever you're recording and you're not on program or preview. Now, I think this should probably be a menu option. I haven't really seen that kind of color code before on a camera. Perhaps I missed it, but it seems strange to me to have another tally color. I can imagine it being a little bit confusing for on-screen talent to ask, what does the orange one mean? Um, so I'd probably remove that. I'd love it to be a menu option where I could remove that and then maybe just show it on the screen for the camera operator. Let's dig in a little deeper to the Pro model and take a tour of the inputs and outputs on that. Now at first glance, you may see that it looks extremely similar to the Plus model with its robust carry handles, that seven inch display, the tally lights. It's basically the same shell. It just has a few more ports added. In this case, we have SDI in and output, and these are for up to 12G Ultra HD signals. Below that, we see an Ethernet port, which allows for quite a different workflow. On the other side, we have the same two USB ports, but we also have two XLR audio inputs, a talkback headset connector, and then we have our mic in and headphones as well. And spinning around, you can also see that the back button from the Plus model has been replaced with a PGM or program button. Since this model can do SDI in and output from a switcher, you're able to get a return feed of a program from an ATEM switcher. This way you can press the PGM button to see what is on program right now, and then you can stop pressing it to see what your camera is actually seeing. You can also double tap it to lock into the program mode. This can be pretty useful for camera operators. Maybe they're on a long shift and their camera is not on air much so they can see what is on air, or they can just double check to see what's happening in the program feed. While the screen size is the same, the Pro model has a 2000 nits display, which can get really bright. With the combination of the sun hood and the really bright screen, I can see this being used nicely outdoors. The SDI input and output workflow is a really interesting one. In fact, if I dust off my old A10 Television Studio HD, it has the ability to have SDI inputs and outputs and talk back to and from the camera operator. And I think I'll dig into this in my next video, so stay tuned for that. A completely different workflow for these cameras is that one ethernet port on the side. Using that connection point in combination with the currently unavailable Blackmagic Studio Converter allows you to send program, video signals, talkback, all through one ethernet cable. Now, unfortunately, while I do have the Pro Camera here, I don't yet have the Studio Converter box. So when I get that, if I get that, I would love to make a video about that single cable operation. I think that's a really good way to use this camera in productions. It's really good to see full-size XLR inputs on the Pro model. I think that's a really important addition. For many gigs I've done in the past, I've wanted to send audio in through the camera so it comes to my switcher in sync with the video. And many venues or meetup locations have XLR outputs on their audio consoles, so having XLR inputs is a must-have. Now that we've taken a look at both cameras and how they work, I wanted to set up a little studio environment here in the tiny house and see how well they work together for a podcasting style recording. I've just set up this little environment here where me and my girlfriend are going to use the cameras and use some microphones to record a little podcast. I've got the plus camera pointed at me and it has a 15 millimeter lens on it. And then the pro camera is pointed at my girlfriend and that one has a 25 millimeter lens on it. I've also got this wide shot just as a safety and it's a Panasonic GH5 with a much wider lens on it. All three cameras are recording 4K ISOs so I can use that footage later in the edit. The output of the A10 Mini is connected to this monitor and then I have each of the cameras connected to the A10 Mini over HDMI. I've also got the A10 software control running on my laptop here so I can make all the adjustments needed. And then as we go through, I'm just cutting on the A10 Mini, doing a record on the A10 Mini as well and recording on all the cameras. 
So I have all of the stuff that I need for post-production. Now I will say for this kind of use case, the built-in screen on these cameras is not really much use to us. Whenever I set up the shot of my girlfriend, I was able to look at that just fine. But after that, I wasn't really looking at those screens much. I was mostly looking at the screen on the table. However, if we were to expand this operation, you know, take our podcast on the road, then having these cameras already might actually work in our favor. We could take them somewhere, hire a couple of local operators and get them to manually operate the camera while we record our own podcast. And if we opt for the 4K Pro cameras with the SDI, as the space and the complexity grows for our production, we can move our cameras further away and not be limited by HDMI runs and we can really scale the operation. So now that we've wrapped the recording of our little podcast, I can press stop on the cameras and press stop on the ATEM Mini Pro ISO. And then from there, just drag the project file into DaVinci Resolve and replace each of the cameras with the 4K ISO recordings that I set up earlier. Then I can use Resolve to make any changes and export a really good quality 4K podcast and video podcast recording. Now it would be a real shame not to explore a very common question that came up on the announcement of these cameras and that was why did Blackmagic choose MFT as the mount option for these cameras? Blackmagic created a couple of new products to sort of overcome some of these issues with MFT lenses, the zoom demand and the focus demand. Now unfortunately I don't have either of those to test out and in fact like I've mentioned I don't have any powered lenses but Doug over at DJP did make a great video about the current options in terms of powered lenses and you'll find a link to that video in the description of this video. I encourage you to check that out and you can really see what your options are right now for MFT powered lenses. However, with that said, I must admit that for my use case, it doesn't really matter the powered lens side of things. I do a lot of fixed location stuff. In fact, most of the stuff I do these days is here in the house, which is all fixed. The camera is an arm's length away and I can grab over and change the focus if I need to, or I can use the ATEM software control to make those changes. I live in a pretty small but pretty bright house, so I have to wait to nighttime before I can test out the low light capabilities of this camera. Now this channel is by no means the ultimate place for camera tests and reviews, so I will leave it up to some other people to do proper camera low light tests, but for my use cases, I'm really happy with the improvements over the previous model. A couple of final pros on this camera is how well it works in the ecosystem of the Blackmagic design world. So just plugging it into your ATEM Mini or plugging it into your older ATEMs, it all just works nicely and it all works seamlessly together. That is a huge pro and it's very hard to beat that. That excellent menu system is a big bonus. I've used many types of cameras and there's nothing quite as intuitive as the Blackmagic menu system I've found. And it's nice to see two different models, the Plus and the Pro for sort of two different markets. I'd certainly encourage going for the Pro model where possible, but the Plus with the HDMI only is an excellent option. A couple of the cons are it's certainly not an all around camera for any type of event. I would use this in very controlled environments. I don't think I would roll up to a conference and hope for the best that it would work for me. I would push it more towards a green screen studio or a studio like mine or smaller spaces like that where you have full control over lighting and full control over everything. It is a shame not to see the XLR inputs on the Plus model. I would like to have seen those on both, but I can see why they wanted to save some money and not do that. But I would love to have seen XLR on both models. Finally, there is an audible fan in the camera. I can just about hear it from where I am, sitting about a meter away from the camera. It's probably not enough to be caught up in the microphone, but it is definitely there. And if you're in a really quiet space, I think you would just about hear it. So uh, that's kind of a downside, I would say. And that leaves the price and some final thoughts. So the Plus model is coming in around $1,295 right now, and the Pro being $1,795-ish, depending on where you're shopping from. So about a $500 increase to the Pro model. And for the most part, I'd probably recommend heading up, getting the 500 extra, and just going Pro. And then for future events and future scalability of your company, you'll be happy that you invested in that Pro model. But should you even get these cameras? Well, I think if you're starting out and building a studio from scratch right now in a controlled environment, then I think it's a big contender. I would definitely recommend it, especially if you have ATEM switchers already and those sorts of things in your pipeline. This will just work nicely with them. If you have already got maybe a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera and you're thinking about adding another camera for your studio setup, then one of these with that nice seven inch display and an operator standing behind it is an excellent choice. I do think it's important to keep in mind the word studio in the name. It's not a run and gun camera for all sorts of events and types of conferences and meetups and wherever you might end up. 
Studio is the important term there, where you do have some time to sit, fix, change lenses, and really get the most out of the camera and what it's built for. If you're like me and you're using it here in your home studio, or maybe a podcasting studio, or even a green screen studio, then this camera is certainly something to consider for those use cases. And if you are thinking of investing in these things, and like I said earlier, I would really recommend at least one of the pros and maybe fill out the rest of the line with the pluses. But if you do want to go down that ethernet route, get the studio converter later, and maybe start to do bigger events or bigger productions, then getting all the pro line might actually make sense. And that one comes with the added benefit of having talk back, program back to the camera, and just tally and things like that, which really add to the overall feeling of a production. All right, I hope you found that useful. That was a lot of information on these two cameras, and I have plenty more to say in future videos. But if you do have any questions about them, do let me know in the comments below, and I'll try to test it, get back to you before I have to send these back to Blackmagic. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.